Great. Let's continue our lecture on computational challenges in cancer immunology. In the last lecture, we were having one topic that's unfinished. Well, let's first visit what we've done. In order to understand cancer immunology, right now, many different new genomic technologies are being applied to cancer immunology. And so all of these new genomic technologies are requiring good computational tools to help with interpretation, analysis, even quality control, right? So um, we talked about what mutations are in the tumor. So this involves exome sequencing, comparing tumor with normal, and then we want to see what mutated proteins or peptides are presented on the tumor cell surface. And this requires us to understand the MHC of the patient, which you can also get from both DNA and RNA of the tumor, or, or even normal HLA can be coming from normal samples as well. But then based on the HLA type, uh, there are computational algorithms to help you predict which of those mutated peptides will be having stronger binding to the HLA. Um, and then the, uh, the next question is, is, are there immune cells infiltrating the tumor? For this, if you have tumor RNA-seq, now people have good computational algorithms to make pretty reasonable predictions. And uh, um, more and more people are also looking into single cell RNA-seq that seem to get more fine-tuned uh, or fine resolution um, gene expression profiles in the tumor. And then um, in the last lecture, we talk about whether there are T cells or B cells infiltrating the tumor and whether the receptors are recognizing the potential mutations. And in the last lecture, we talk about T cells, but in this lecture, we'll talk about B cells. Um, B cells make the antibodies for our body. Um, there are receptors also on the cell surface. These are B cell receptors. But if there are signals to release the receptor outside of the B cells, they will be antibodies. So B cell receptor is just, it's, it's still stuck on the, on the cell. And once it's released, it's antibodies. So B cells also go through this VDJ recombination by randomly selecting V, D, and J and stitching them together. The closest VDJ is able to make a um, antibody with a different sequence from other antibodies. Also, the junction sequence between VD and DJ are also, uh, there are small insertions, deletions, and uh, mutations involved. So that creates the antibody diversity. And so normally what we see is uh, antibody have heavy chain, has light chain, and uh, this heavy chain is very, very important for recognizing the antigen um, specifically and have strong binding. And so, Currently, many uh, technologies are being developed for BCR sequencing. You can either do it in bulk or you can do it in single cell. 10X Genomics also have a experiment that specifically amplify the B cell receptor RNA sequence from the B cells so that in single cell experiment, you could get both the expression readout and the B, uh, B cell receptor sequence if you want to use it to keep track of the clones. And we have also developed a computational algorithm called the TRUST4, or what well, initially was called TRUST and now it's version 4, to computationally infer the BCR sequences. This is from bulk RNA-seq. The reason um, we are doing this similar to the last lecture is because this VDJ recombination creates a sequence that's not in the germline sequence. So when you use star to map the reads to the genome, most of the B cell receptor sequences are thrown out as unmappable to the reference genome. So in addition to um, having this antibody hypervariable sequence recognizing the antigen, once the B cell recognize the antigen, Locally, it will start a small B cell factory to make more clones of itself. And in the process, you can see here, initially you have the B cell circulating in, in the body. Each carries a different type of B cell, well, the different type of B cell receptors with a different hypervariable sequence. But once they counter the antigen, um, 
as B cell are making clones of, of itself, AID protein is a, a, a protein that can create additional mutations on the DNA so that the, the antibody might have slightly changed amino acid sequence on this hypervariable sequence. And if the hypervariable sequence through the mutations, these are called somatic hypermutations, if the mutation is able to create an antibody that has even better binding to the antigen, then the B cells that carry this mutation will receive very strong signal to clone more copies of itself. And in the cloning process, additional mutations will be created. And, and so basically, if the mutation creates an antibody that doesn't bind to the antigen very well, it will not have a very strong signal to proliferate. But if during evolution, the somatic hypermutation are creating antibodies with even better uh, binding, it will receive even stronger signal to clone and continue to evolve. And so you can imagine this local B cell factory, it just make more B cells and in the process evolving better and better um, specificity and binding strengths against that antigen. And uh, that's somatic hypermutation. There are also, uh, is a process called the class switch recombination, which means the constant region, which is here, the constant region can also shift to different things. Um, this is also done at the DNA level. It's always, so this is the VDJ sequence. And after that, well, so there are constant regions after this. Yeah, you can see here, there are constant regions. Um, the, the class switch is to remove some of the constant regions so that the later ones will be used. So it's always the, the constant region on the DNA level that's closest to the VDJ that makes a productive constant region. But if the earlier ones are removed from the DNA, then the later one will be used. And so class switch recombination is kind of a linear event or it always goes from the left to the right so if you have a long constant region, it can in initially be using one constant region and then some deletion might happen. If this get deleted, it will use a later one. If this get deleted, it will use a later one. But if you start from the later one and the front are already eliminated, this antibody cannot use the earlier ones anymore because the DNAs are already deleted from the gene. And so the reason an antibody can have different constant regions is because different constant regions will have different downstream immune signaling. And this is an analogy for this is if you call 911, you might get, well, you, you will get a policemen, firefighters, and ambulance. Each in this case is being called by a different constant region. So the different constant region will get help from different cells. Um, and so these are all kind of interesting. So we'll show you an example of uh, somatic hypermutation. You can see this is uh, a situation where we are seeing the BCR clones from one tumor. They are very, very similar, except this occasional nucleotide differences here. You can see these are unlikely to really happen because many different B cells all evolve or all, all home to the same tumor because if you were to generate from the same antigen you inject different mice they will give you very very different antibodies because many different antibodies can have the ability to recognize the same antigen the fact that we see these hypervariable sequences to be so similar is because there was probably a parental clone it recognized the antigen and it started clonal ex expansion to create these mutations and the clonal expansion that is really abundant and also further away from the deep, like the germline DNA, that's the one that probably the most, um, have the strongest binding and strongest specificity against the target. Okay, so this is something we can actually observe from the tumors directly using the tumor RNA-seq data. Um, you just run the algorithm, we construct a cluster, you can examine the sequence, you will notice these uh, occasional nucleotide differences or amino acid sequence changes. Um, for a somatic, uh, so, so, so previous one was somatic hypermutation, next is 
uh, class switch recombination. Um, so in the antibody, here is the VVJ recombination. Um, IgM is the first antibody in the blood if it's a naive antibody that hasn't encountered antigen. What you will see is the IgM antibody. But once the antibody recognizes, the VDJ recognizes the antigen, then as the cells are proliferating, depending on the signal in the tumor microenvironment or any tissue microenvironment, the cytokines in the, in the, in the tissue might uh, force some earlier sequences to be deleted. And so if this whole region is deleted, then this, the antibody will carry this blue constant region. Okay, so, and if the blue gets deleted, it will use this purple one. So there's an order. Um, initially, the antibodies, you can imagine the young antibodies are like IgM, the old antibodies are like IgA. Because once they are IgA, they have no chance of becoming IgM again. And IgM is mostly from naive B cells, okay? And because TCGA are mostly paired and reads, we can use computational algorithm. By the way, this is an algorithm developed in our group. With one read, you can get the VDJ. But from the other read, we can get the constant regions. And then we will know what is the constant region, what's the kind of the antibody tail that's used. Um, and the VDJ basically provides the recognition of the antigen and the constant region decides what is the downstream effect uh, signaling. And if we look at the TCGA, you will notice that um, uh, th these are different TCGA tumor types. And uh, this is the antibody they contain. And different um, tumors might have different percentages of some antibodies. But this, in general, are telling us the tumor are recognizing. The, in the, B, the B cells in the tumor are recognizing the tumor antigens. They are clonal expanded. If they're not clonal expanded, we will only see pretty much IgM antibodies. Um, most of the IgG and IgA antibodies are already clonal expanded and class switched. Um, and this is because the B cells in the tumor are encountering the tumor antigens and recognizing the tumors. And so these are very important for us to, to kind of learn about briefly. Um, so normally, um, IgA antibodies are what is produced in the mucosal tissues um, such as your mouth, your, your whole GI tract, the lung, um, because, for example, the food you eat clearly are outside. You do not want your immune system to attack the food as if they are germs. This is like the immune system will get unnecessarily inflamed. And so all the mucosal tissues are covered with IgA to uh, insulate the, what is outside from um, the inside the immune system. And uh, interestingly, if you look at the TCGA data, you can see that there are many tumors, even though they are not, well, so there are tumors that have mucosal tissues, like this is colon cancer and rectal cancer. You know, they are in your GI tract, gastric cancer. Those you can imagine that they have a lot of IgA antibodies because even normal gut have IgA lining the gut mucosal tissues. Um, but for many other tumors that are clearly non-mucosal tissues, we still see, you know, anytime you see either a light green or dark green, these are IgA antibodies, which is kind of surprising. You know, why would a non-mucosal tissues produce an uh, IgA? So we, we, in our lab, hypothesize that potentially um, the IgA is kind of a, a, like a liquid bandit to say whatever is outside is the, the air you breathe or the food you eat, even though there are occasional germs, so there's no need to get too alarmed. And so the immune system would not go to attack it. And so if tumor is able to produce more IgA antibodies to cover the tumor, then T cells potentially also wouldn't at attack the cancer cells. So that's a potential mechanism. Initially, um, the IgM might be recognizing the tumor antigen. It will be shifted to an IgG antibody. And IgG actually is attacking the tumor. But if there are cytokines changing, it deletes the things in the front, when the, the cytokines induce this deletion. 
And then the IgA antibody will become actually a helper of the cancer cells to prevent immune cells from attacking the cancers. Okay, so these are some of the things we would be able to see by looking at the tumor RNA-seq. You can look at whether it has more IgA or IgM. Um, in some of the solid tumors, we do see that the tumors having more IgA seem to be associated with worse outcome. Um, so that's you know, a, a, a another question that we discuss, you know, are there T cells and B cells that recognizing the tumors or the, the tumor antigens or tumor mutations? The next question is, um, what controls T cell mediated killing? And so in, um, we mentioned in here, T cell receptors are constantly surveying the, the outside to see, outside meaning that outside the T cells, to see whether in any of the, the cells that it encounter present antigens that are foreign. Um, but after T cells are, are recognizing the T cell receptor, there are other molecules that are involved in order for this T cell to be activated. There are immune checkpoint genes. These are PD1 or CTLA4. If they get bound or activated, T cells will be in a dysfunctional state, which means that they, they will have a stop signal from getting activated. Um, so if PD1 or CTLA4 are not uh, being uh, bound by their ligand, then they can interact, then they can allow the T cell to be activated. In addition, there are also co-stimulatory or co-inhibitory molecules. Co-stimulatory molecule include things like CD28. And so in order for the T cell to be in an active state, T cell receptor needs to recognize the bad, the, the, the kind of foreign antigen, CD28 needs to be stimulated but the checkpoint genes like PD-1 and CTLA-4 cannot be stimulated. When all the conditions are right, then T cell can get activated, right? So in the process, we will see a lot of transcription regulation and epigenetic regulation. And so nowadays people are, are looking into both uh, transcriptional profiling, including single cell analysis, and also um, uh, the um, epigenetic profiles, including nowadays single cell attack seek analysis. And so this is one earlier study where they, they are just looking at early lung cancer using um, single cell analysis, comparing you know, normal lung with uh, lung cancer to see what is the difference. And uh, they also uh, tag these with antibodies to really check to make sure that cell identity is correct. Um, but this is kind of what they see in the lung cancers. Um, they see that the number of CD, uh, natural killer cells decrease. Um, these are two different types of dendritic cells that can present the antigen, the tumor antigens, to either our T cells or B cells for, for recognition. And the CD141 is a type of dendritic cell that can present antigen in a more efficient way, and you see the the, the level decrease, whereas the, the CD1, the dendritic cell, doesn't present as efficiently, the, the level increase. And then they see um, PPR, PPAR gamma, this is a transcription factor in macrophages, they start to increase. And then they see um, uh, that the, the T cells in general have more PD1, which means that uh, these T cells are being, being, becoming more dysfunctional. Um, and also, uh, they see CTLA4, which is a, you know, basically CTLA4 high or PD1 high. These are all increasing in the tumor, um, suggesting that um, the, the um, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment are really changing a lot. And this basically would, the, the reason we're seeing this in the lung cancer means that the T cells are not working very well. They are not getting activated because Tregs are much more increased. The existing CD8 T cells are getting dysfunctional. Antigen presentation is no longer efficient. And there are other macrophages and you know, other immune cells which might be secreting the cytokines to suppress the microenvironment. Um, this is an epigenetic study where people use a taxic on the mouse uh, this is mouse exposed to um, tumor, and you can wait for a different time for short term versus long term. 
and, uh, and they, they take the tumor out at different times. So initially when the tumor are growing, so this is the normal, and then this is the kind of early stage of tumor and uh, starting to have metastasis. And then these are really um, late stage, 60 days um, after the, the tumor. Um, but you, you can see here in general, this is looking at PD-1 level in the tumor, and this is interferon gamma level. Um, if you look at the epigenetic status, you can see here in the normal stage, PD-1 here is expressed lowly, but also you can see epigenetically, this gene's promoter has very low signal. Um, but as the cell is becoming more and more uh, kind of the T cells keep trying to kill the cancer cell. Eventually, it just get tired and too exhausted. Um, and then you can see um, there are new additional enhancers. This is from Ataxic. There are new enhancers which seem to really influence PD-1 expression. Now PD-1 are expressed at much higher level. And also interferon um, is the cytokine that is expressed at the, by the T cells to eliminate the tumors. You can see once the T cells are in this PD-1 positive stage, they also lose some other enhancers in here, which means potentially even though the promoter of interferon are still active, the expression of the interferon gene is decreasing potentially because of the lack of stimulation by this one transcription factor binding site. So you can see from here, people are understanding um, what happens in immunotherapy um, or, or cancer incidence. You know, why would T cells stop to kill the cancer cells? It's because over time, the T cells get exhausted, it's just trying very hard. And um, um, there are studies also showing that if you have immunotherapy treating the tumor, and if the T cells are in this early stage, they are really already very potent, they can kill the cancer cells. And it, at this stage, usually tumor doesn't grow very fast. Um, but you know, over time, if, if the tumor continue to persist, eventually the T cells will keep trying, keep trying, you will get exhausted. Immunotherapy, there are studies showing that it can revive the T cells in the early exhaustive stage, which means you just started to, you know, like see a little bit of PD-1 expression, but interferon expression is still high. So it's, you know, maybe the, you can imagine it's like a tipsy. The, the cell is just getting a little bit dysfunctional, whereas the late dysfunctional stage in, in this stage is like a very, very dead drunk soldier. And um, at that point, even existing PD-1 therapies alone will not be able to revive those T cells. And so epigenetics provide information in addition to uh, gene expression to give you information on um, T cell dysfunction. Um, uh, another question is, is, what other cells can be activated to kill cancer cells? Um, so we mentioned T cells, they are the main workforce for current immunotherapy. Um, B cells also have effect on um, killing the cancer cells. So um, there are two different mechanisms that B cells can work in this case. One is um, both are dependent on antibody. So if the antibody recognizes the antigen on the cancer cells, it will bind to a complex, complex called C1Q, and this will gradually, indirectly, recruit a membrane attack complex. And this is a very big uh, complex with many members, and they will just punch holes on the cancer cell, and the cell will spill its guts and, and die. And so this is one way. The other one is once the antigen recognize the, or the, the antibody recognize the antigen through interaction with another receptor on the natural killer cells, it will be able to recruit the natural killer cells here. Um, the natural killer cell coming to the nearby environment doesn't directly kill the cancer cells. It will kind, kind of go into the micro environment and, and sense which cell is under stress. And it's, it's only the, uh, the cancer cell Actually, all the cancer cells are under some stress situation because it's trying to proliferate. It's actually under a lot of stress. So the cancer cell surface does have the stress signal on the cell surface, and that will really stimulate the natural killer cell to start killing the, the, the cell that's under stress. 
Okay, so this is called the uh, antibody dependent cellular cy uh, cytotoxicity because the antibody itself does not provide the killing. It's a natural killer cell that um, comes to the microenvironment and starts the killing. Um, we also, uh, as we mentioned, natural killer cell now is also uh, a, a type of, um, initially people believe it's innate immunity, but because it can be stimulated by B cells, it also can be considered to be related to the adapt uh, immunity. Um, and so this is one situation. So the, you can see here, um, once the natural killer cell comes to the microenvironment, two signals will make the NK cell kill much better. One is a stressed signal. Any cell that's under stress um, produce some cell surface proteins to indicate that it's under some stress. Natural killer cells will look for such signals. And if it sees this, that's a very good indication that this is a cell that's under stress. Another situation is, uh, oh, sorry, another signal that's important is any cell that is expressing um, MHC, um, if it's MHC1, it will in interact with the receptor on the natural killer cells. And if these two interact well, then uh, this will inhibit NK cell from activating. Interestingly, for many um, bacteria, viral infection, one way for them to not being seen by the either the T cells or NK cell is to perturb the antigen presentation mechanism in the host cell. And that host cell may not really present MHC. Uh, therefore, the bacterial or viral in, um, proteins will not be presented on the cell surface. Natural killer cell uh, also look for cells that does not have MHC1. Because if, if it, the cell does not have MHC1, it's an indication something is wrong with the cell, either with a viral bacterial infection or maybe the cancer cell has evolved to not have MHC. And if this happens, the inhibitory signal will no longer be there. And if the cancer cell also have activation signal from stress, that will really stimulate the NK cells from killing the, uh, stimulates the NK cell to kill the cancer cells. And so right now there are a lot of studies or efforts trying to understand how can we activate the natural killer cells to recognize cancer cells and kill it. Um, another one is macrophage. So um, macrophage have two different phenotypes. One is um, M1 macrophage. This type really will eat up the cancer cell. It will recognize the foreign kind of antigens on the cell surface and it will eat up the cancer cells. Um, it will stimulate inflammation, stimulate uh, the immune microenvironment. But then sometimes the cancer cell will secrete some cytokines. So macrophage uh, changes from an M1 to an M2 macrophage. M2 macrophage is more pro-tumor. This is related to tissue repair or wound healing. Um, uh, again, um, you can imagine when we have a, a wound, like a scratch, your your immune system kind of will go there initially to prevent you know any bacteria from getting into the, the 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 wound, but macrophage also goes there to serve kind of like a liquid bandit as well um, because if your new tissues are being generated and your immune systems keep on attacking it, then the, the wound cannot heal very well, and so cannot heal the wound. Therefore, um, for, um, for M2 macrophage, once um, it goes there, it will just cover the wound area and allow the normal epithelial cells to grow gradually over it. And the, so the T cells does not keep on uh, attacking the new uh, healing location. Um, this is a kind of another way cancer cell can learn from other normal cells. So you can see cancer is really um, sneaky, right? It can learn the mechanism from um, stem cells to proliferate. It can learn from uh, the, the mechanism from the gut to pretend that it's kind of a gut to force the B cells to ha have produce IgA. It can also produce cytokines to pretend it's a wound. And so the macrophage can be covering the the, the, the cancer and the T cells cannot go in. So you can see these are also um, other uh, 
mechanisms. So the question is, can we then give the, the um, patient the correct type of cytokine so that they move to the left side, um, to the M1 macrophage, which normally kills bacteria and also can uh, recognize the cancer cells and potentially kill the cancer cells, okay? So these are some of the um, potential um, other ways that people use to, um, or are, are working on to see whether you can activate to um, kill the cancer cells.